It's time for you to look inward and begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you and what do you want? In Stellaris, an origin is a key component in the backstory and gameplay interpretation of your interstellar empire. And in this video, we're going to go through all 32 origins, break down exactly what they do, the pros and cons for each of them, and then place them in a tier list. With the release of Stellaris First Contact, we have more origins than ever before. So I do recommend you get a snack, you get a beverage, you sit yourself down, and you prepare for this monster of a video. We're going to go through this in the usual format for this channel, starting off at the bottom in the F tier and working our way all the way up to the S tier. Without any further ado though, let's just dive in and get started. At the very bottom of this tier list, we have the F tier. Generally, the origins in this tier are not only useless, but actively harmful for you and your campaign. Yes, I'm going to go through some specific ways that these origins can be used to get a boost, but if you play them as intended most of the time, they're completely and utterly worthless. First up, we have an origin that has not seen love in a very long time. Galactic Doorstep allows you to start with a dormant gateway in your capital. That will bring the following in the first few years. Some alloys or minerals, a small amount, a single small space amoeba, and then a special project that creates the From Gateway Scent archaeological site. After that, when you actually reactivate the gateway, you'll unlock gateway construction technology. But all of that is a long way down the line, and the bonuses here are just completely pointless. I mean, yes, an archaeological site singular is kind of alright, and a small injection of alloys or minerals once is nice but other than that i mean this this origin really needs something because as it stands this is the way you can play the game without in essence having any origin enabled next up we have life seeded this is going to start you on a gaia world that is size 30. on the surface that sounds absolutely fantastic you have a very large world and it is gaia meaning your biopops will get plus 10 percent happiness and plus 10 percent resource output from jobs However, you also lose both of your guaranteed habitable worlds and your species preference is set to Gaia world, meaning you will be at 0% habitability, which is absolutely no habitability on any other planets. This makes expansion near impossible for this origin. It is such a nerf to your playthrough that basically you could only take this if you want to have quite a challenging start or alternatively, you plan on building up a very, very early alloy economy and gobbling up a close neighbor to use their pops instead. Now having said that, if you want to do that, it's probably easier to just take one of the other origins. Calamitous Birth requires that you are of the Lithoid species type. You're allowed to build meteorite colony ships, which are cheaper and cost minerals. They also travel faster than regular colony ships, which is, to be honest, neither here nor there in the current patch. And then when they finally land on another planet, you will cause a lithoid crater to form. These lithoid craters give minus 50% habitability, nerfing the plus 50% habitability you get from being a lithoid, which is one of the only few bonuses. This means you can only use your meteorite colony ships on planets which are the same preference as your species type, but you will still be getting the negative effects of being a lithoid, that is minus 25% pop growth speed and pop assembly speed. Yes, you do get on your homeworld only a massive crater, increasing the maximum number of districts, increasing the maximum number of mining districts, reducing agriculture districts, which you don't really care about as a lithoid, and increasing your pop growth speed to offset that reduction from being a lithoid. But this is only specific to your capital. You do also get access to a few uh, lithoid blockers as you clear them, spending a lot of minerals on doing so, you will be rewarded with pops. But that does not offset the fact that you have to be a lithoid and you then lose the 50% habitability bonus on any world you will colonize with a meteorite colony ship. It's simply not worth it, in my opinion. Common Ground and Hegemon basically do the same things. 
Common Ground allows you to start with the Diplomacy Tradition Tree unlocked, and you'll start with the Federation Tradition. You'll also start as President of a Federation with two other members. You'll get some bonuses to Permanent Opinion Modifier with those members, and some trust right from the get-go. And on Day 2 with Common Ground, you'll also now get to choose the Federation type, meaning you can be a Military Federation or a Research Federation, or anything as long as it isn't a Hegemony. If you want to be a Hegemony, you'll need to take the Hegemon Origin, and then you'll get exactly the same thing, but with a Hegemony. Both of these Origins remove your ability to have any guaranteed Habitable Worlds at the start of the game. In fact, your guaranteed Habitables will go to your Federation members, your Federation friends, and that presents you with quite a bit of a problem when it comes to expansion. It's possible when rolling this that you can basically be backed into a corner. Yes, you can jump over your Federation allies, however that's going to cost you quite a bit of influence. There is one powerful way to play both of these that don't put them in the F tier, and instead put them up quite high probably in the A tier. And that is, if you eject the other members of your federation one by one, and eat them in Conquest Wars to gain planets with quite a few pops relatively early on. If you completely dissolve your federation in this way, you will get a boost to your early starts, as long as you can pull off those early wars, but that is really not the way either of these origins are intended to be played, and you're basically giving up quite a bit of the quote unquote bonuses that is meant to be given to you by having a federation. And that's why I'm keeping them all the way down here in the F tier. If you play them as intended, they're pretty garbage. And if you're enjoying this video, please retcon the origin story for that like button. Last up in the F tier, we have an origin that is quite inimical to your health. Doomsday means your capital planet will eventually explode in about 35 to 45 years. You'll also get no guaranteed habitable worlds around you, and that means it can be difficult to find a planet to live on and prevent your empire going the way of the dodo. There is an edge case where Doomsday can be very, very powerful and possibly A tier, if not maybe S tier. I will go through that one briefly at the end, but first let's look at why it's so terrible. Well, you also get the Doomsday modifier on your capital world. And every 10 years, each of these bonuses will multiply by two. They won't double every year, they'll multiply from this base value. So at the start, you'll get a reduction to habitability, stability, and immigration pull. You will get some bonuses, plus 30% alloys, minerals, and energy credits from jobs, and that will go up to 60, 90, and finally 120. However, when your habitability is so low as a regular empire that requires habitability, this is completely crippling. Now I did mention there is a very effective way to play this origin, and that is by negating the main drawbacks, those being a reduction in habitability and stability. By taking a rogue servitor machine race, you can completely ignore the habitability reductions, and the massive stability bonuses from having 80 or 90% happiness biotrophies can let you ignore the reductions to stability. That means you'll be able to grow a massive alloy or generally resource economy, because you'll be getting bonuses to minerals and energy credits here too, and go and launch a crusade in the first 20 to 40 years before your homeworld even blows up. After which point, you should have quite a nice little empire that you can manage. Now we've reached the C tier. Generally, in the C tier, we're not losing things like guaranteed habitable worlds, which was the majority of what was lost earlier in the F tier, because that is a massive limiter to your growth potential. However, in the C tier, what we do have generally is a very hampered economy early on at the start of the game. That may be alleviated later on by some powerful bonuses, but Stellaris is a game where small advantages will accumulate, and even if you have a powerful bonus coming very far down the line, it might not be worth it if your neighbor has outcompeted and subsumed you long before you get there. The Remnant's origin has been reworked quite a bit with Solaris Patch 3.7. We now start with an Archaeo Studies technology research and a faculty of Archaeo Studies building on our capital. 
However, all of the numbers from minor artifacts have been kajiggered and moved around a bit, and they've actually made this origin rather weak in comparison to where it used to be, which I have been very surprised by. So that Faculty of Archaeo Studies will grant you a minor artifact income, meaning that roughly every 45 to 40 months or so, you'll be able to sell minor artifacts and get 500 energy. On the other hand, the faculty comes with a whopping 20 energy upkeep, meaning it's simply not worth it. Net, you're not actually making a profit here. This is just a terrible, terrible business idea. On top of all of that, when you clear your ruined arcology blockers, you now get between 10 and 50 minor artifacts. Unless you get the top end of 50, you can't even use the sell minor artifact decisions once. That is really, really terrible. The crux of why Remnant was actually passable in the previous patch was that as you cleared the blockers, you would get an economic and technological boost. That is no longer the case. Yes, in the long run, you'll be able to turn this relic world back into a fully fledged Acumenopolis without taking the Ascension perk, and that is nice. However, I'm entirely not sure you're going to be getting there unless you've got some really good gameplay. It probably isn't worth that bonus given you might just find a relic world out there in the galaxy anyway without having taken this. In closing on the Remnant Origin, I should mention when you take your two guaranteed habitables, you get the Colonial Remains modifier, which reduces the cost of all of your new buildings and districts by 25%. And that is relatively nice and should not be overlooked. Next up we have the Syncretic Evolution. This is an origin I really want to like. You can specialize your worker pops because you start with 12 pops of a secondary species that will be your workers and have the servile trait. You can specialize them into worker specific roles with worker specific traits and then specialize your primary population into being specialist only roles. However, it's basically like the cheap bargain basement version of Necrophage. It doesn't come with many of the bonuses Necrophage does, and the servile trait, if we look at it, isn't that great. You're going to be getting plus 10% happiness and 10% resource output from jobs. Those pops cannot be leaders, and they can't work specialist or ruler jobs, which can be very difficult to manage if you're a newer player. And that are the only bonuses you get from this origin. Post-apocalyptic is better than it has ever been in Stellaris, specifically with the introduction of Stellaris Toxoids and the Relentless Industrialist Civics, which finally gives us the ability to terraform worlds into tomb worlds. This will give you the survivor trait on your species and your homeworld will be a tomb world. Survivor grants you plus 70% habitability on tomb worlds, putting you at an uncomfortable but still okay 70% and plus 10 years leader lifespan. The issues with this origin is that you don't get any guaranteed habitable worlds as tomb worlds, and other than being able to live on the few tomb worlds you may find in the galaxy or terraform using percussive terraforming bombardment stance if you're a fanatic purifier, or just regular terraforming if you take relentless industrialists, it's not going to be that great. Anyone can come in, conquer your planets, and they will have access to a fantastic population ready to live on any tomb world, i.e. your pops. The Shattered Ringworld origin got quite the rework as of patch 3.6. It is still not as good as those heady days of 3.0, where we basically had access to a fully functional ringworld from the start of the game, and all of the craziness that could ensue from there. However, the way that it's been updated is that you now get two other Ringworld segments that you can inhabit right from the get-go. They start with 0% habitability, but by clearing a few of the blockers on those Ringworlds, you will then increase the habitability incrementally by 25% at a time. If you're a machine origin empire as well, this gets even better because you don't need to clear those blockers to get access to the pop assembly on these Ringworld segments and then shift all of your assembled robots back to the capital where they can be used very effectively. The main downside with this origin is that you start with the Ringworld preference type as a biological empire. That means colonizing anything but your capital and the two Ringworld segments next to you in your home system is pretty much impossible at 0% habitability. However, 
if you're a robot, this probably deserves to be in the B tier, if not the low A tier, because you can completely sidestep that with maximum habitability on all of the other worlds around you. Ocean Paradise is very similar to the Gaia World Origin. You'll start on a size 30 ocean world, which gets its own special little modifier that I'll go over in a minute, and you'll start with the aquatic trait. You'll also lose both of your guaranteed habitable worlds, however, you will still be ocean preference, so you may have the chance of finding ocean worlds out there in the galaxy that you can actually live on. And that is why this origin is sitting one level higher than life seeded in the C tier. It is probably the bottom of the C tier, but it is not as bad as Gaia seeded. I did mention it, so let's jump back in and have a look at the modifier you get from this one, and that is the Ocean Paradise modifier on your capital planet, plus 15% happiness, 10% pop growth speed, and 5% resources from jobs. It's not quite as good as a Gaia world, to be quite frank, because your overall resource output will be slightly lower, however that additional pop growth speed is rather pleasant. Subterranean is something of a meme origin. Your mining districts will be uncapped with this origin, meaning you can build up to the size of the planet with mining districts. You'll also get plus two housing per mining district and plus one building slot per three mining districts, basically meaning mining districts function like agriculture districts with agrarian idle. Then comes the memeiness, minus 75% orbital bombardment damage. When you combine this with one of the early perks from adaptability or unyielding, you can get all the way up to the maximum minus 98% from orbital bombardment damage very darn soon. You also have many, many minerals from all of those uncapped mining districts, so you can build lots and lots of armies and hold out as long as you really want to, possibly even longer if you take the zombie civic. However, you'll be getting a plus 10% building and district cost and upkeep, and minus 10% planetary build speed. On top of that, your species will have the Cave Dweller trait. This trait gives you plus 15% mineral output, but it does give you minus 20% biological pop growth speed, and plus 10% empire size from pops. You will also get a minimum habitability limit of 50%, which means no planet will be particularly hostile to your species. You can combine this with the Toxoid trait Noxious, giving you a locked habitability of 80% on every planet, which is nice, but then you'll never get to 100. Knights of the Toxic God gives you one of the worst starts economically in the game. You'll generally be negative on most resources other than minerals and alloys when you start off. You'll also start with three fewer pops. However, there are some upsides. You do get a habitat in your capital system which will already be inhabited, meaning you're going to get pop growth on not just one planet, but two right from the start of the game and you'll get access to the Quest for the Toxic God situation, which, as it progresses, will grant you more and more bonuses to the knights on that aforementioned habitat. However, that quest is going to cost you a monthly energy and alloy upkeep, which is really unpleasant and goes towards contributing to that terrible economic situation I talked about earlier. If you can get past the early game and still be alive in the mid game, yet yeah, you should be doing all right. By the late game, you'll have some absolutely terrific and ludicrous bonuses on that habitat from your knights, but it really is difficult to survive that early game, especially in multiplayer. Payback is one of the three new origins we got with Stellaris First Contact. This one, however, is possibly the weakest of those three origins, and that is mainly down to the dismal start you get right from the start of the game. It is slightly better economically than Knights of the Toxic God, however, you're going to be starting with 10 fewer pops, you'll also start with absolutely no ships, and you won't even have the ability to build things like corvettes right from the get-go. You'll have to research some of the basic technologies other empires take for granted right off the bat, and you'll need to clear some orbital debris around your capital to stop getting the excruciating modifiers from that debris field, making building new buildings and districts rather expensive. 
There are some positives though. You'll start with an archaeological site in your capital and by clearing it you will get access to being able to restore this flagship orbiting your capital. You can either turn it into a battleship again which will grant you a 4k ship around year 13 to 15 or you can turn it into a habitat. Now I would actually recommend you turn it back into a battleship that should give you enough firepower to declare a conquest war over one of your neighbors very very early on and completely obliterate them taking most of their stuff putting you in a very very strong position. That new ship has a cloak has a relatively good build design and can be upgraded to get more and more powerful as you unlock more and more ship technologies. Not only that, you start with a prosperous unification style bonus on your capital granting you additional happiness, amenities and resources from jobs for the first 20 years. Oh, and as a final little bonus, you'll get a plus 15% damage to militarily superior empires meaning that if you are militarily inferior but can defeat them in detail that becomes much easier for you. We've now made it up to the B tier which is the middle of this tier list. Origins in this tier generally give you some sort of bonus whilst having either no or limited drawbacks. The bonuses from these origins though are not as powerful as those in the higher tiers and that's why they're still here. There is one exception to that and you'll see as we go through which one that is. Lost Colony is quite an interesting origin. When you take this one, an advanced empire with the exact same species as you and random ethics will exist somewhere else in the galaxy. Now for certain empire types, specifically the more xenophobic empires out there, these additional pops in the galaxy which are the exact same species as yours can be very very beneficial to take. But that's not why this origin is rather good. You also get the colonial spirit modifier. That gives you plus 10% happiness, 15% amenities, a whopping 15% resources from jobs and plus 10% habitability. Now that habitability is important because your capital does not count as your homeworld so you don't get the plus 30% habitability bonus that almost all homeworlds get. Instead when you combine the colonial spirit modifier with your base preferred planet modifier you end up at 90% habitability. That that can easily be overcome and pushed up to 100 if you take something like aquatic which is quite a powerful trait anyway. On top of all of that, colonial spirit remains in place for the entirety of the game. Unlike other modifiers such as the prosperous unification modifier or the modifier we saw with payback a little bit earlier, this will not disappear after the first 20 years making it quite a potent game long effect. Mechanist has recently seen some love from the custodian team and we should be thankful for that. However, it is still not as powerful as the equivalent origins that push you down the other ascension paths. What Mechanist is going to do is it will start you with the powered exoskeletons and robotic workers technologies, meaning you can build robots right from the start of the game and you'll also have the machine template system technology as a permanent research option so at any time once you've taken and researched that you can modify your robots. Additionally, you will get plus 15% mechanical pop assembly speed for the entire game and plus one mechanical species trait picks. This means Mechanist is one of the best origins to take if you're planning on going down the synthetic or cybernetic ascension paths because these buffs will be a direct boost to that ascension path. So on your capital you will start with a robot assembly plants, 8 of your pops will be robots rather than regular pops and they will come with some predetermined traits. Basically they'll be good at mining and farming. This is actually very powerful and puts your pop growth speed almost on par with a hive mind start which is really really good. Additionally, as long as you put those robot assembly plants down on your colonies as well, you'll get this pop growth boost across your entire empire. And as you well know, pops in Stellaris are one of the most important resources. We actually need them in order to get almost all of the other resources. Tree of Life is a hive mind specific origin that gives them a fair few bonuses. You will start with a Tree of Life on your capital world, all of your ships will cost less alloys but more food and if any of your planets reach 50 devastation the tree of life will die. 
Any worlds without a Tree of Life have some large penalties. Minus 50% planet build speed, minus 25% resources from jobs, plus 10% upkeep from jobs, and a small but still painful minus 5 stability. The Tree of Life itself does give you small but noticeable bonuses, plus 15% pop growth speed, plus 10% society research, a nice bonus of plus 10 housing, which means that taking something like solitary will not be an issue whatsoever, and an increase to the number of agriculture districts you can have on your planet. The saplings that you get on every other world are basically slightly tooled down versions of this capital building, providing all of the same buffs, but just a little bit less from most of them. Overall, this origin complements quite nicely the strengths of a hive mind, that being high pop growth speed and assembly. On the shoulders of giants is the archaeology origin. This is going to give you an event chain's worth of archaeology sites scattered all over the place. When you finally complete them and complete the event chain in the mid game, you'll get a nice permanent bonus to your empire. As of patch 3.7, the individual benefits from each of these archaeology sites and completing them is quite a bit lower. Our actual output of minor artifacts will pay for far fewer sales of those minor artifacts, so we won't get as much of an economic bonus right away. However, as long as we pick up quite a few, and this will be an RN Jesus hope thing, as long as we pick up quite a few minor artifact deposits when we actually finish those archaeology chains, we should then get a steady stream of minor artifact income coming in, and that should allow us to convert it directly into energy credits. It's also important to know that until you finish your a special story, you cannot discover precursor anomalies or sites. This is now, with the improvement to the precursors, quite a big nerf. Hopefully, you can still find one to begin a precursor chain after you finish your story, because after you do, finding precursor anomalies or sites is buffed by a three times higher likelihood. And as long as you have a minor artifact income, you should be able to spam that decision to find more and more precursor sites and thus complete the precursor chain. As of patch 3.7, it's no longer possible to abuse the dragon that spawns in with Here Be Dragons in quite the same way. With Cordyceps, you will still be able to get a 100k dragon, it just comes a little bit later. That being said, having a 30k dragon in your capital system is quite a nice defensive bonus to have, especially in the early game. On top of that, you will get various bonuses, and even if you don't kill and resurrect the dragon, which I would definitely recommend you do, oh my goodness me, you will at some point still be able to get control of the dragon. Slingshot to the Stars is an origin you might be very surprised to see all the way up here in the C tier. The last time I did this tier list last year in 2022, it was firmly and definitively placed in the F tier. Oh, how the times have changed. As of patch 3.7, most of the negatives for this origin have mysteriously melted away. You still have all of those lovely bonuses though. Minus 75% starbase influence distance cost, meaning it is very cheap to go and forward settle systems and take them away from any pesky neighbors or block them off, or if you're feeling really nasty, steal their guaranteed habitable worlds. On top of that, the quantum catapult you get will now be at plus 50% accuracy when you use it. Additionally, fleets when they are flung with a quantum trebuchet get an additional fire rate bonus of the first 120 days of plus 33%. For you with this origin, that becomes plus 50%. You'd also start with the ruined quantum catapult very nearby to you. That increases the chance of getting the mega engineering technology, which will be very nice in the late game. So whilst this is still not overwhelmingly powerful, I think it could have some niche uses, and I am very looking forward to seeing people using it in PvP environments if they can get it working. Broken Shackles is a new origin that has arrived with Stellaris First Contact. 
This one lets you start with not just one species type on your capital, but in fact a multitude of different species that each have different habitabilities. This means that you can, in essence, operate like a machine empire and colonize any planet out there. If you're really lucky, you'll also get a post-apocalyptic, yes, a tomb world empire species in there, meaning that you've got all of the bonuses, basically, of the post-apocalyptic origin, because you could even have that trait. There are a number of drawbacks. You start with a few technologies missing. You also start with a somewhat weakened economy. This is probably the bottom of the B tier in terms of the start you get. However, you also get some nice bonuses. First and foremost amongst those is the fact that you basically get parliamentary system for free for the first 10 years or so, which is absolutely mind boggling. This means you'll get factions forming from basically day one, it's actually year one, and from that you'll get extra unity and extra happiness especially if you throw in egalitarian so you can shift the faction ethics of your pops before these factions form, meaning you don't get any of the wrong factions forming. You also get an archaeology site and extra bonuses on your capital for the first 20 years. There are some negatives I haven't mentioned yet, and that is the fact that you will start with Stellar Culture Shock giving you a few minus 10% for the first 10 years. Though it's not an overwhelming negative, your stability should basically even that out as it is. This origin also guarantees that all of the species on your capital world will have a pre-FTL homeworld out there elsewhere in the galaxy. And every time you find one of those pre-FTL homeworlds, you will get some bonuses which are really quite nice. Extra happiness and extra stability, if I recall correctly. Last in the B tier, we have an empire that again does not fit the mold of the rest of the origins in this tier. Fear of the Dark starts you in a relatively weak position because you have eight fewer pops than a normal start. This is quite painful, however, the reason this is up here in the B tier is what you can get out of this origin. At the start of the mid game, an event chain will spring up that allows you at the end of it to either spec into fanatic purifiers as an additional free civic or simply take a free civic on top of the normal number that you already have. This means if you become Galactic Emperor, you can end up with five civics, which is just absolutely bonkers. On top of that, when you meet your first alien empire, you will get the option to declare a total war against them and there's basically nothing they can do to stop this. If you play your cards correctly and you have a military ready to take advantage of this situation, it means you can entirely engulf a neighbor without having to spend any influence on making any claims, so you can first focus on expansion, then eat a neighbor when you find them around year 15 to 25, and then continue with the game until the mid game where you'll be able to put in an extra civic for free or just go full YOLO and fanatic purify the galaxy. I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't mention that you do get minus one research alternatives and minus one leader pool size when you take this origin. Yes, that first one is relatively easy to offset, but that second can be rather annoying, especially if you don't have the RNG gods on your side. And then the plus 10% anomaly discovery chance and plus 20% anomaly research speed are fine but barely worth mentioning. But what do you think of my placement of these new origins? Are they actually less powerful than I'm describing or possibly maybe a bit more powerful? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. For the first few hours after this video goes live, I will endeavor to read as many and reply to as many comments as I can. We've now made it all the way up to the A tier. We are over two thirds of the way through the massive list of origins you can choose from in Stellaris. Everything in this tier, the A tier, is definitely better than the B tier, but not quite as good as the S tier. Prosperous Unification is the bog standard origin in Stellaris. However, that doesn't stop it from being really, really good. You'll start with four additional pops and two additional districts, so you have an economic bonus there. On top of that, your homeworld gets a special modifier, 
which grants you additional happiness, amenities and resources from jobs for the first 20 years. And one final minor bonus is that the planetary unification technology starts as a permanent research option, so you will always have that at whatever time you need it. All of this combined should give you enough of an economic step up to be ahead of quite a few neighbors around you. Resource consolidation is arguably the best origin for any non-rogue servitor machine intelligence. You will start with a capital system where your home world is a machine world. This gives you some lovely buffs. You'll get extra production. Once you clear a special blocker, you'll get additional pop assembly. And then on top of all of that, you will get to build as many energy or mining districts as you want, because that is a core function of machine worlds. Void Dwellers is one of those unique origins that really changes up your gameplay experience. Instead of starting with a capital planet, you instead have three habitats in your home system. You'll also start with the habitats technology researched so you can build more of them. You'll get some other technologies already done too, so you do have a slight technological advantage over other empires. On top of that, early on, you are getting the pop growth from three separate colonies, so your pop growth should be higher than regular empires. However, habitats do have some issues when it comes to housing and the number of districts they can field. You'll quickly run into pop growth and housing issues on your habitats if you aren't careful. Your pops do have the habitat preference, so putting them on a regular planet is very much not advised. They will have 0% habitability. Not only that, because they have the Void Dweller trait, they will get a whopping minus 30% happiness when they're on a regular planet, and minus 15% output, as well as minus 10% pop growth speed. This is somewhat counterbalanced by the fact that on habitats, you do get plus 15% pop output. With this kind of empire, you're going to want to find other pops, either through conquest or migration, to take all of those lovely planets you otherwise will not be able to grab. Teachers of the Shroud is the psionic origin. When you take this, you will start with the latent psionic trait, which in essence means you've unlocked the psionic ascension perk. You have not completed the Psionic Ascension path, however, and you will need to complete the Psionic Tradition to get all of the bonuses associated with it. You'll also get some rare crystals, which can be used nicely to do some scouting right at the start of the game, and you'll start in contact with the Shroud Touched Coven Enclave. All of that aside, the real strengths of this origin are the fact that you will in essence get one additional ascension perk as compared to other regular empires because you won't need to use it to take the mind over matter ascension perk and become a psionic empire. On top of that, there will be no RNG related with fully psionically ascending. And given that psionic ascension is arguably the best ascension path if it can be completed very early on, this leaves you in a very, very strong position by the mid game. And looking at the clock, we're now over 37 minutes through this tier list. I think it's time for the secret call out. If you're still watching, if you haven't skipped ahead to the start of every chapter just to see what the tier list is without listening to me explain my reasoning, then congratulations. This is the secret call out. Let me know down in the comments below if you made it here. Last, but by no means least in the age here, we have Overtuned. Overtuned is, in essence, the genetic ascension origin. However, you're not forced to actually pick genetic ascension if you don't want to keep around all of the fantastic bonuses from these overtuned traits. And that is the main buff of this ascension. Overtuned and the ability to genetically modify our species right from the start of the game. These overtuned traits are in essence direct clones of regular traits, however they cost a fraction of the price in terms of trait points and they do come with a downside and that is a reduction to leader lifespan. However, as long as you play your cards correctly, you can generally ignore that leader lifespan issue as long as you don't go too far into the overtuned or alternatively by picking Hive Mind, whose leaders generally start off in the low five to 10 year old range. And therefore you've already got an additional 30 years of leader life to burn through as opposed to a normal empire. 
We're now at the top of the pyramid. Here are the aristocratic elite when it comes to origins. Nothing gets better than this. And nothing gets better than clone army origin. You will start with no ability to reproduce organically in a regular way. Instead, you will have ancient clone vats that provide pop assembly. You can build up to five of these clone vats across your empire, supporting up to 100 clone pops. These clone pops will get bonuses when they become admirals, specifically 25% fire rate and a reduction in ship upkeep of 10%. On top of that, when you're actually producing these pops through pop assembly from their vats, you will get a staggering level of pop assembly. Some are in the region at 20 at the highest, down to 2 to 4 at the lowest when you only have 1 or 2 pops left to fill up at the very end. You'll also get the choice to either ascend or descend with your clones. Descending means your clones are no longer produced by the clone vats and you will be able to reproduce through regular pop growth. On the other hand, if you go for clone ascension, you will get some staggering bonuses to each of your clone pops on your planets. They will produce a phenomenal amount of specialist and ruler resources. When we combine the pop growth with the fire rate bonuses and then with the possible bonuses for ascension, we end up with clearly the strongest origin in this game. Scion starts you as a vassal of a fanatic materialist or fanatic spiritualist fallen empire. You will have a wormhole leading to your overlord's capital system and you will get a powerful gift from them every few decades. You will also gain a temporary fallen empire fleet every 20 years if you are losing a war against a superior empire. All of this combined basically means you get to play the game on easy mode. You'll have a big brother looking after you who doesn't really ask for much in return. You'll still be able to expand. You won't have to pay any resource tithes or anything like that. And Papa Fallen Empire will come to your rescue if somebody's being a bit mean in the playground. Necrophage is the meaner, older, scarier big brother to syncretic evolution. You will get the ability to define two species from the start of the game, a ruler or specialist class, that's your necrophage class, and an underling worker class. On top of that, your guaranteed habitable worlds will instead be pre-FTL civilizations with a number of pops on them all the way up to possibly Iron Age. This not only reduces the cost of your initial colonies, you'll only need to spend a few hundred minerals on armies and invade them rather than having to build the much more expensive colony ships, you'll also get access to a workforce right out of the gate. And if you are some form of xenophobe and you don't like that workforce, you can purge them using a special necrophage purge option to turn them into your ruler class species. Due to this special purge option, you can in fact invade any empire anywhere in the galaxy other than machine empires and make use of their pops, even if they are clone armies or hive minds. If all of that wasn't enough, only your necrophage pops can be leaders or rulers, making it very, very easy to do slave management properly. And you will get access to the necrophage trait, which gives you a whole host of bonuses, including longer leader lifespan and additional bonuses to output. For best effects, it's generally pretty reasonable to make your necrophage species into a lithoid. Imperial Thief is very, very similar to the Scion Origin. This lets you start as the subject of an Imperial Advanced AI Empire. You will be granted the opportunity of becoming one of these specialist vassal types right out of the gate. There are merits to each of these, but one of the best is almost certainly the Bulwark type, which is going to grant you some large mineral, food and energy subsidies from your Overlord. And the overall downside is very, very minimal. After 40 to 60 years of being protected by a nice, juicy, powerful overlord, who you can probably make research agreements with and the like, very, very helpful, your overlord empire will start declining and may even enter a civil war. At that point, you are in a prime position to not only become the true overlord of this entire arrangement, but also, if you make some very nice claims, eat up most of the fantastic worlds your overlord started with, amongst which include a bunch of Gaia worlds that aren't really good and filled with good pops. 
And that is before we get into the realms of any overlord abuse that you can do. And finally, we come to the best hive mind origin in Stellaris, Progenitor Hive. This will allow you to not only get a constant gain of experience for your leaders every month, making it very, very easy to get level 10 leaders and all of the massive bonuses they come with, but also you will get access to these special offspring ships. Now, if you don't have an offspring ship, yes, you'll get some penalties. Minus 50% accuracy, evasion, ship fire rate, and sublight speed. However, with offspring ships in your fleet, or actually just in the system, you get a 5% bonus to fire rate net. You also get access to a special starbase building, giving you a net plus 15% bonus in that system. These are some of the best bonuses available in the game to hive mind empires. On your capital, you'll get a special bonus for housing the progenitor nest, plus one monthly organic pop assembly, which is very tasty for a hive, plus five stability, and a whopping plus 20% amenities, vastly reducing the number of maintenance drones you are going to need, thus increasing the economic efficiency of your capital quite a lot. And if that wasn't enough, if the best ships, the best leaders, and the best capital for a hive mind empire in the game aren't enough for you, say hello to the Offspring Nest. This does everything that a spawning pool does, but it also grants you plus 10% menial drone output, meaning all of your drones are slightly more efficient. It's so, so pleasant. Origins only form one part of the backstory of your empire in Stellaris. If you've enjoyed this breakdown of Origins, and you'd like to find out more about the civics you might pair with your empire, click the video on screen now.